Now we're going to talk to three reporters. These are reporters that represent three important high pro oh, have a seat, please, gentlemen. Three, um, oh, you're going to sit down? Like, oh, no, go ahead, go ahead. I'll have you raise your hands. Three, these reporters represent three important high-profile influential media outlets, and we asked them to join us today to talk about what they're seer hearing, seeing, thinking as they cover business, energy, and technology stories. So we're really going to do a quick panel discussion here on stage. Um, let me introduce the panel very quickly, and then we have a couple questions uh, to ask the panel. And um, we'll go ahead and get started. So as I introduce you, if you'll just raise your hand, that would be great. So uh, Jonathan Fahey is a national energy reporter at the Associated Press. He's based in New York. He joined the AP in 2010. And prior to joining the Associated Press, he spent 10 years at Forbes magazine, where he covered the auto industry, technology, and energy, and wrote a weekly science column for Forbes.com. OK, Scott Tong. Scott, raise your hand. Thank you. For the past decade, Scott has served as an on-air correspondent for Marketplace, the daily business show on uh, public radio stations around the country. He founded the program Shanghai Bureau in 26, 2006, excuse me, serving there for four years. And now he reports on energy, resources, and global economics for the program's sustainability desk. And last but not least, Matthew Phillips. Uh, Matthew is an associate editor at Bloomberg Business Week based in D.C., where he covers energy, economics, and finance. Uh, previously, he was a reporter in Newsweek, and he was also a Knight Bahut. How did I do? Yeah, okay, that was close. Fellow at Columbia Business School. So I want to thank them. Now, on to the media panel. Okay, is my mic working? Great. All right. So um, our hope here is just to have a sort of a casual conversation, ask panelists some key questions. Um, a couple of you have submitted questions for us, and we'll just go ahead and get started. So I guess I'd like to open up the panel to all of you to really, we want to focus on the broad trends that you're seeing in the intersection of business and sustainability. And, you know, you guys really do sit at a pretty unique place um, where you can see these broad trends in the marketplace. So what are some of the trends you're seeing now? What are, are you focused on new technologies, climate, leadership, resilience? If you talk a little bit about what you see from your perspective in terms of trends in the market and what it is you see evolving over the next couple of years. So, Don, let's go ahead and start with you. Well, of course, the climate is, uh, is, is continuing to be a story. It will, all, it will be a story for a long time. I think it's going to be, obviously, all of us here probably think that it's going to be an important story for a long time. Um, and then, so the tension is, how do we address the climate problem. Um, it, it's it's a, a, a story that's important. Um, it is a, a challenge is, is to figure out how to tell it because the, you know we're in the end we're writing news and new things have to happen and the science around climate is not new. Uh, we know what's happening. The science isn't changing. Um, the question is how how do we deal with it, and the answers are are relatively clear from a from a big picture standpoint, right? Um, change our energy mix, reduce, be more efficient, but but to to find the news in that that the regular person, I mean, we'd like to read this kind of news, but the regular person wants to you know they have their they have their tablet, they have their phone to get the regular person to, to pick up a story and read about it is, is, is the big problem here. It's a big, important story that can be difficult to tell. Matthew. Uh, I spend a lot of my time covering kind of the intersection of energy and the economy. Uh, that's manufacturing, that's oil and gas. There's a lot of news with the shale boom over the last few years, for sure. Um, one of the things that, that I'm interested in and uh, that I see kind of going forward, we have a lot of this conversation about this increasing competitiveness of U.S. manufacturing in particular. Uh, I'm not sure how much, you know, that, that is a sustainability uh, question as it is kind of um, a, a, a rising uh, wage situation in China, but also cheap uh, energy in the U.S. And so what I'm interested in is kind of uh, n not just kind of cheap um, inputs uh, from, you know, low-cost natural gas that is going to make uh, making things, actual physical things here, uh, uh, more profitable again, but um, the idea of making the, the physical plants more efficient uh, and more sustainable in the way that they use energy 
uh, I think is a, is a big story that's only really started. Um, the trick is is kind of finding the uh, the points to tell that and and finding uh, the stories at small and and large companies uh, that kind of fit into to an overall trend. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking at at the moment. Scott. You know, I, as you were asking that question, I thought about, uh, well, one, one of the guys who you work for at Bloomberg, uh, Michael Liebreich at uh, Bloomberg New Energy. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's, he has quite a contrarian voice when these big uh, climate summits come. Um, and he finds them a waste of time. He makes that argument. But what I find interesting is, is what he talks about now, and that is kind of getting to wherever there is kind of two degrees uh, um, in a climate sense is the contours of that future are, are, are already starting to, we can start to see that in a way we couldn't see, say, in Copenhagen in 2009. Um, so uh, you talk a lot about grid parity here and wind and solar and what's happening there at, on a, a utility scale, on a rooftop scale. Uh, we do a lot of stories about that. Uh, we're doing a series on infrastructure at Marketplace in, uh, in June, second week of June. Certainly the leadership part, uh, I live here in Washington, and so now if the, the US and China have both made these pronouncements in the lead up to the Paris conference, I think the leadership, uh, uh, you know, part of that is um, somewhat, we've done these stories before, and, and as you say, it's kind of challenging to do that, but um, you know, we see that piece, we see the, uh, the role of natural gas and the question of whether it's a, whether it's a bridge fuel and, and we're seeing a lot more in the distributed generation side. So I think if you see a lot of the kind of the, the, the business engine, the engineering pieces to the future, um, if that becomes a little more clear, uh, you know, I think that as a, as a way to, to frame, as a way to perhaps see the climate story a little differently, we're always trying to find ways to see it a little bit differently, to tell a story in a different way. Um, we're certainly gonna focus on, on a fair bit of that in the lead up to Paris in the winter. So I think that's a great point, so that there's room for and relevance really of the emerging business sides and things people are doing differently. I guess, what do you think are the types of energy and sustainability resiliency stories that generate the most interest from your readers, from your editors? Clearly, they're the ones that have to approve the piece. Um, do you have thoughts on what's interesting? What are the big stories now? Well. The, the big continuous story that our, our audience cares about and our editors care about and the host of the program cares about is, uh, is the shale story. Um, they kind of can't get enough of what they think fracking is. Um, and so we do, we, we chase that story a lot. And uh, the, the frustrating part is um, there's so much theology uh, that's associated with the story is I'm not so sure that the public is is exposed to a very good quality conversation about it as many stories as we do about it. Interesting, Matthew. Do you have thoughts? Yeah, on I mean, that? I've been chasing the shale story for three years essentially, and uh, we had a huge kind of. Uh, you look for pivot points, and we had obviously an enormous one last summer with uh, prices going from $100 to you know a bottom of 40 uh, earlier this year and what that's done to a lot of these small independent companies that have been kind of the engine of this. This isn't your big majors that, that have uh, seeded this kind of uh, revolution. It's, uh, it's now they're much bigger companies today than they were say in 2007, eight, and nine, but still uh, whether they've, they're gonna be able to hang on through a, uh, a lower price environment and I think they've been more resilient than, uh, than a lot of people expected. A lot of people expected kind of these fire sales that we'd private equities would be swooping in and, and buying up wells and companies, and that hadn't r really happened. And so um, you, know, you, you have to wonder why capital markets have been willing to extend kind of rescue financing to these companies. But getting back to this idea of how we frame stories and, and um, you know, pitch editors. When I'm at a desk at, uh, at a table of, of editors at, at Business Week, and uh, you know, it, our purpose is inherent in our name, Business Week, we, I'm telling business stories. Uh, we need to not just um, find something that's compelling and interesting and, and news, but also something that has some tension to it uh, and is surprising 
to us and to our readers. And so, you know, w watching some of these, uh, these stats roll off the board here, I thought to myself, this, these are great stories. Um, uh, but, you know, the idea of coming to an editor and saying, hey, uh, company XYZ reduced their energy footprint by 20% uh, last year, great. Okay, so, well, what's the story? Well, you know, we need kind of, uh, we need a next, we're, we're kind of through the phase one, I, I feel like, of, of this efficiency story. And we need kind of a second level to understand, well, how does this affect their bottom line at the, at the end of the day? Does this make them more profitable? Does this make the U.S. in a bigger sense more competitive uh, relative to the rest of the world? We have, uh, to, just to build on that, we, we need a narrative. We're telling stories, right? We need a larger point. We need a, the, a reason for a person to read this. I, in terms of efficiency, we look for, it's, it's hard. What we look for, um, we look for, for tension. We look for a human story, if possible. We look for, e e you know, either small or big, a human story that is compelling uh, about one person or a, a big story that tells a larger trend about the way the U.S. or this business or the, or the, or the world is going. I did a story uh, last week about a, a, a scientist at General Electric who spent 30 years working on this very obscure material, a, a ceramic comp composite. And, you know, here's this one guy slogging away for 30 years on this little piece of material that we'll, we will never see or touch. And, uh, you know, you talk to him about, did you think it was going to fail? He had DOE funding. He had funding from his company. He had funding from the military. It would come and go. And now it's going to, you know, it, 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 he figured it out. GE's making all these manufacturing plants to build the stuff. And it's putting all its in, in all of its engines. And it's going to save g billions of gallons of jet fuel in the next decades. I mean, it's going on all the planes. It's light and whatever. You know, so here's a, 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 piece, a lightweight piece of ceramic that no one's ever going to see. But at least there's a human story behind it that helps us tell the story because it, hopefully it's interesting. Now, I don't know if anybody who read that story is going to go to a cocktail party and say, did you hear about the new ceramic? Okay, I, that's uh, the ultimate goal is that's, that's where we want. Did you read this? Did you have to read that story? That's where we want to be. I don't know if it got there, but that's the kind of thing we're trying to get to. That's very, very helpful. So go ahead, uh, Scott. It's just uh, one word that we throw around a lot uh, that, that sounds like big is, is scale. So I, I was at a conference not long ago where uh, uh, private equity investors said, you know, we, we, look for, we look for things that are not just interesting but meaningful. And editorially, I think we ask that same question is uh, there's almost this editorial valley of death or something is really interesting, but how do we think about the, the scale? You know, how many billion gallons of, of jet fuel are we talking about? Um, or gigatons or something? Um, and, and sometimes we don't know the answer to that, but certainly the editors who are thinking about the stories and those of us who are chasing them are, are, are looking for that um, all the time. But I, I agree, I think, you know, certainly, the editorial judgment is a very subjective thing in our in our newsroom, but we're we're we're, we're kind of looking for the confluence of all these things, right? Some some tension. When, at what point does the man fall in the hole <laughs> in the story? Uh, you know, that person. What is that person's story? Where's the scale in the story? Where's the tension? And how new is it? How how different is it? Right. I would say the trick uh, to to all you guys out there who would like to see um, you know all these good stories be be covered. Uh, often the key is, is giving us access to allow us to find that engineer that's been slaving away at this thing for 30 years. And I know that that can sometimes be a touchy thing of letting a reporter in and, and giving this person access. Uh, but it really is at the heart of being able to tell a compelling story that gets beyond the headline, that gets beyond the numbers, and reminds people that, you know, these are people just like them that are, that are working towards something. And, uh, that would be just one, one thing that I would throw out there that is always helpful and can often be the, the difference between um, doing a story or, or not, to be honest. I think that's tremendously valuable insights from you all. So I, I was um, interested by something that Jonathan sort of said. Do you have a, 
favorite story that you've written about the kinds of things that we're looking at, driving greater efficiency, really making a business case. I think your point's about making it personal. I mean, the, you know, at the end, we're all people, we're all interested in the humans who are behind some of this innovation, having access to those people is really important. But I'm just curious in thinking through the things either that you've written or that you're interested in writing, is there something that you know, jumps out to you as a really interesting piece that you think that we'd all be interested in hearing about other than the silicon, little piece of silicon? <laughs> um, let's see, I, I think there's an interesting, um, I think our response to low energy prices um, is going to be very interesting. Um, I've written a little bit about it uh, r uh, late last year. I think I, 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 I would love to find more ways to write about it. You know, when a lot of this efficiency policy came about, it was the middle of the last decade, and the, e even through the, the financial crisis, because we thought that energy prices then were only down because of the, the economy. So that was a time when natural gas was high and rising, oil was high and rising, it, things looked really bad on the, on the energy prices front. And the momentum behind energy savings legislation and policy and consumer behavior, or that momentum behind consumer behavior was, was strong. It, was, it wasn't so much a political issue. I mean, it's always a political issue, but it was the, the savings were so apparent, were so clear. The national security implications as imports were rising were clear. There were all these, you know, and then the personal pocketbook issues, all these things were lined up toward using less energy and, and, and adopting policy that forced less energy or, or encouraged less energy. Carbon is on sale, coal is cheap, natural gas is cheap, oil is cheap, that, and it's domestic. That's a very different set of of, of circumstances now. And I'm curious to see how that is going to uh, play out in terms of consumer demand and policy. Yeah, I would, I'm glad that you, you raised that because uh, the world that existed just um, five or six years ago has is is completely changed. We are no longer kind of faced with this idea of scarcity. We're, we're, you know, we're swimming in, in crude oil. Uh, we've, we've doubled almost our, our production of it in the US. Uh, SUV sales are through the roof. Uh, so how do we keep this uh, momentum of efficiency and uh, ultimately uh, carbon reduction um, applicable and, and keep the incentives going in a world where, uh, you know, w we might not see $100 uh, for a barrel of oil in, um, a few years. I mean, if, if you know, you have uh, Saudi princes saying we'll never see it again, so they seem to know what they're talking about. So, who, you know, um, how do you keep that momentum going, I guess, in the face of such, really, uh, when you look back over the past 50 years, we've never seen kind of this pivot that's been so dramatic in terms of going from uh, perceived scarcity to perceived abundance, or to actual abundance. It's the first time where we've had low energy prices w with a growing economy. Right? Yeah. Energy prices have bottomed out plenty of times, but it's almost always associated with uh, economic downturn, which we come out of and go back. This is energy prices down when the economy is, is doing well and it's been growing for, for many quarters. Mm -hmm. So does that move us past a business story and really an organizational resiliency, sustainability strategy as we think towards addressing climate and climate issues and how do you reconcile that with the interest of businesses and driving shareholder value? Makes it a lot harder, I think. It, it was already difficult, uh, so. So maybe the interesting thing too is all the work that some of these organizations in the audience are doing, even given the low price of energy, you know, the sort of long-term decisions that they're making for their organizations to drive greater efficiency in their work. Scott, I didn't know if you wanted to add Well, I, I um, Self-interest, right? I mean, as business programs, uh, we, we have a, a great appreciation for self-interest. Um, I'm working on a story now about a hospital. You know, we're, we're doing several stories on infrastructure and the power grid and 
And as some of you may know, Danbury Hospital has had this combined heat and power cogeneration for, for several years. And so the money, the $200 million you're gonna save over the next few years is paying for the new wing of the hospital. You know, as, as, a, just as, as an interesting kind of example of, well, what does that you know, kind of contribute toward and what is the technology? So, I mean, I think some of those kinds of decisions are, are going to be made, you know, rightfully in, in self-interest, um, um, somewhat independent of some of these kind of fossil prices that, that we're seeing now. So some of those, I think, stories are, uh, will, always, will always be there. Um, you mentioned which, uh, which stories were either interesting to do or, or got a lot, of, a lot of bounce. The shale revolution, you know, to some degree, yeah, it connects to an individual who is also kind of in the lab and failing for 17 years. You know, um, his name is George Mitchell, and he um, he died a couple years ago. So I got a chance to visit with him. He was w well into his 90s, but I spoke to some of his team about how, as a small independent, and they were kind of laughed at in the Barnett Shale uh, in in North Texas, and how. You know, it's it's the innovation story of a little bit of luck. Um, and uh, persistence and, and entrepreneurs doing what everyone else uh, regards as, as crazy. Um, so, right, this kind of individual who, who believed, now, you know, the separate question of whether, uh, on, the car, on the climate side, whether, whether gas is a bridge or not, you know, is a very interesting story that I think, I think we're still looking for the answers to. Um, and, and back on shale, the, the one, piece on the web that got the most reaction was, it wasn't even a story that was on the air, it was a, a BS detector, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of um, calling out all of the, uh, the very interested parties on each side of it. Um, and if you want to get a lot of hate mail, you can, you do that. <laughs> there you go. Or there write you. about gasoline prices, that'll yeah. get you hate yeah. mail. Oh, lots of hate mail. There's yeah. something I didn't have on my agenda. Okay, yeah. so just to wrap up the panel, um, I appreciate you all being here. And you're sitting in a room full of people who are actively, energetically pursuing energy efficiency and greater sustainability in their organizations. And just advice from you all in terms of helping them tell their story, helping think through how they're part of a bigger story. So we've clearly heard personalize it. We've heard understand really the dynamics of individual organizations and what, why they make the decisions they do, why things are new, what it means to be news. The definition of news is doing something new. So I just want closing thoughts from you all from where you sit, thinking through media, media coverage, the stories that we're gonna see in the next couple of years, and then thoughts for people in the audience. I guess I, I would say, um, when you're thinking about trying to tell your story, don't think about colleagues in this room, people like us who are energy dorks and who would read this no matter what. Uh, think about getting someone, uh, you know, at a cocktail party or you know your spouse uh, or you know someone who wouldn't doesn't walk around the world thinking about energy. Getting their attention, getting them to say, huh, that is cool, or that is meaningful, or that is important, or that is innovative. Um, you, you, uh, you guys are understandably, you guys are doing, doing work that is, you're understandably proud of, uh, and, and, and th that's terrific. But to, to turn that into something that is newsworthy, it needs to reach beyond, you know, the people like us who care about it. So I, I, that'd be my one piece of advice, is, is think outside of people like us. Great advice, Matthew. Yeah, I think I would just uh, kind of reiterate what I said earlier is that, you know, we're happy to tell positive stories, no doubt about it. But uh, if, if you're thinking about how to pitch, uh, you know, how to get this story out into the national press, understand that when we have to um, then take that to editors and then think about um, why this matters, uh, we need to get beyond kind of the, the headline data points and uh, understand how this fits into a broader context. And also, I feel like we are kind of, even though we've got some very good traction over the last few years, we, we're kind of reaching this uh, evolutionary kind of stage two where, yes, all these companies are, are building um, more efficient buildings and using less energy. Well, so what? So what does that mean to the economy? What does that mean to their bottom line? And so connecting those dots is really going to be the key. That's great, Scott. 
Uh, I had one thought on, on, on timing. Often we're doing stories that are kind of uh, explanatory, and so when we're doing particular stories, doesn't always align with the big uh, announcement um, that an organization would like to make. So very often when I'm speaking to people about stories, it, it is a time question of, of um, we'll come back to you later. And obviously, um, that can be challenging for organizations, or they, they you know, obviously when, when something is coming out, they would like the, the public conversation to happen now. And just speaking for, for my kind of organization, it, it, you know, the, the timing doesn't always align. So, um, you know, let us talk to you, let, let us kind of stay in touch with you. And, and frankly, very often organizations kind of, you know, if, if their window is closed, they're, they're no longer kind of interested in staying engaged. Um, there's one um, company in the energy space that I'm, I'm trying to embed in that company. And, and uh, the, you know, one of the persons there has something very interesting said to say, and that is, uh, well, you know, th this, is a, this is a bunch of engineers and they tend to be risk averse. And so tell us how, how we can kind of control, how are we gonna be able to kind of control the outcome and control the message? And I said, well, you can't. Um, and that's the, the challenge is, is uh, which organizations will go further down that conversation and which ones would rather not have it. Very fair. Okay, well, timing, I think um, I really appreciate, I know we all appreciate, speaking of the timing, you guys taking time out of your day, your busy days as reporters, to be with us today. So I, if we can all just give the panel a round of applause. So.